in my personal opinion, uh, from a precision rifle standpoint, you usually have to spend a little bit of money to get quality, or at least um, good enough to be called precision. It, you know, again, opinion based, just like budgets are. Uh, but that a thousand dollars for a um, thousand yards is is definitely achievable. I've seen it done many times. All right, everybody, we got a really fun one for you here. We have Nick Loffenberg and Scott Parks across the table from Mark and myself, Jimmy on the mic right now, and uh, you guys are both into the long-range thing. And uh, we've had you on the podcast before a couple of times now, so you're no strangers. Um, but today, especially with Scott, Scott, we're going to try and <laughs> reel you in here a little bit. I know this isn't something you love to talk about, uh, but we're t- trying to talk about long-range on a budget, um, so that's kind of a that's kind of a buzzword these days. Budget. What can you do? Everybody's trying to see what you can get away with. How can I do the coolest thing possible for as little as possible? And um, I don't know if that's a byproduct of everybody wanting to try so many different things these days, and so they're trying to just like do a lot with a little, or if or if everybody's just kind of like now just kicking the tires of some new stuff because you're trying to get out and I don't know maybe be outside more or something. I think it's natural to test boundaries, right? It's like, well, what can I get away with? Yeah. Or like I said, you, you want some diversity, you want to do some different things, maybe you just don't have a lot of coin, maybe you're getting into something and you don't want to like, you know, go yeah. just all out. Well, and the problem is that now with modern technology, you've got all these different guns like on the table. We'll get into these because I know we had a budget rifles podcast, but and we'll go into some of that stuff here. But but the whole package. But you got rifles now that cost like 350 400 bucks, and everybody's saying it can shoot out to a grand just fine. And you're like, okay, so why then would I go for the one that's 700 bucks, which everyone says can shoot out to a grand just fine, or the custom budget bill this is mine from our pod venture a while back that's like 1700 bucks that everyone says can shoot out to a grand just fine i mean they all say they can do the same thing and and so it's it's kind of complicated um but guys budget like we were talking about before um it's all relative right it depends on who you're talking to these could all be on the table considered quote budget guns but they're all very much i think we have about a twelve hundred dollars spread here so, um, what's what's the deal with that? What what do you say when somebody's looking like what should somebody consider being budget? We can even throw like a price range on it. Maybe this is like your budget competition gun, whereas th- those are budget recreation guns. Or at what point? Why do we even have different budgets for like competition versus just shooting for fun? And right. how about that? Well, a lot of people, and I remember kind of when I started getting into long range shooting, um, there was a pretty big craze going on at the time of. Uh, you know, a thousand yards for a thousand dollars. That was like a, that was considered like budget. And in my personal opinion, uh, from a precision rifle standpoint, you usually have to spend a little bit of money to get quality or at least um, good enough to be called precision. It, you know, again, opinion based, just like budgets are. Uh, but that a thousand dollars for a um, thousand yards is, is definitely achievable. I've seen it done many times. Um, but that's, I think, a good baseline to start off with. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, you've got, obviously, in that, we're including, because I know we did a 1,000 yards for a 1,000 bucks kind of video back in the day. Mm-hmm. And actually, if you included the entire package, we have one Atlas bipod that we were switching around between a bunch of different guns and a suppressor that we all use because, like, suppressors are the best. So we switch around between different guns. Yes. Some people got upset about <laughs> that because technically those did push us over the $1,000 yeah. limit if you looked at everything. But full package, if, you know, let's say you're shooting off of, of a, a, you know, a regular style Harris bipod or something and you're just not shooting suppressed, then you can kind of take that within a thousand bucks. Yep. Um, now, what is it that, um, I guess we can talk about gun and caliber selection first, even though, like I said, we've, we've kind of done a podcast on that, but, but interesting, it would be interested to get your guys' thoughts on it because you guys weren't on that podcast. Um, what is it that you're getting... The more money you spend, so if somebody says, all right, I'm determined to stick within a certain budget range, so I'm going to go for the less expensive rifle um, in in a a caliber that's not as expensive to find. Of course, you can't find anything nowadays, but um, what are they giving up? that they would be getting with the more expensive stuff? Yeah, I mean, are you limited in the cartridges that are going to be available to you? No, not these days, I don't think. I mean, 
compared to a custom rifle, sure, right? Because right. custom rifle, it's custom. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the big things that I think gets overlooked, um, I know I surely did when I was first getting into it, is is trigger, right? Okay. Like if if especially if you're first getting first you know getting started in this um, and don't have um, a good background in trigger control, you know maybe if you shot USPSA for a bunch of years you know, pistol competition, and now you're moving a rifle, you understand trigger control. Yeah. Um, but if you really just get into it, you know, trigger is a huge, huge thing. Um, so the better trigger you can get, the easier it is going to be for you to learn how to shoot that rifle. And that doesn't mean super light either necessarily, right? No. No, you want just consistency in that trigger. Consistency. Gonna, that's what I was going to ask. Okay. Like, describe, describe, like, what a good trigger means to you. Um, very little take up. Okay. Um, like imperceivable, ideally, um, and just a good clean break. Okay. Um, I like something with a very defined wall. You know, I hit that wall, and the break is consistent every time. So I know what that trigger is supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. Am I a total noob for still loving blade triggers? Like, I wish my, pre- I wish this gun, this precision custom gun that we built, had a blade trigger on it. I just like it. Does Wait, that does that like make me? Shoe? As in, like, you know, like, on the like Ruger this, American, sure. it's got this blade oh. thing on it. You know I mean? <laughs> hey, look at you guys. See, you're, you guys are probably cringing yeah, really. at me what saying is that. that? <laughs> it's kind of like a, it's like the poor man two-stage trigger. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, I like it. Because Savage had that with the Accu trigger, right? Uh, yeah. I I'll had say, a, like, whenever I get behind somebody with their super dialed in, really, like, Gucci expensive rifle or whatever, and I get behind that trigger, it's just like, I never, like, I'm not quite i'm always uncertain behind it because it's like there's no take up like you said scott and so there's no indication to me personally having never shot it before of like it could go off it could go off could go oh there it goes and uh with a blade you know or whatever these kind of things are you kind of like you pull that thing back and you're like now i'm ready I, i think you've shot this thing so much jim that it's actually just part of like your shooting process yes. like it's yeah. part memory. of like how you perceive how a rifle should operate and that's how that's things go when it. it goes bang and we did in our budget rifles podcast we uh we proclaimed just all the positive attributes of if you are going like straight budget like like Scott said, like this is like the budget two stage, but I will say it probably is. Like, it's like, oh, I'm classy, I'm drinking wine, and you're like, well, that's a five dollar bottle of wine. Yeah, nice barefoot. <laughs> if, if I'm not uh, mistaken, Drink that also that. acts like a uh, safety, safety too, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I love them. <laughs> well, I I will tell you that years ago you were in, in company with me because I was I started out with a Savage rifle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I loved it the same way you did. Hmm. Um, and then as I got more into competition shooting, um, where time is of the essence, hmm. um, it it caused more problems for me than than good. Because yeah. what I would I would basically rush the trigger pull or squeeze. Okay. Um, especially like for something like um like a moving target, if you have, <clears throat> you know you. you you typically have to be on the trigger fairly quickly. You don't have much, t- you know, you have a small window when you can pull the trigger, you know, squeeze the trigger, right? And for me, this is, this obviously isn't everybody, this is just for me, um, I found myself not going to the wall first. I would just yank, yank Bam. through the whole trigger. Oh, and then you got, then you got all this kinds of play yeah. and slot before the trigger actually goes When you're off. talking like about speed, is that almost like an extra step? In um, the process, just versus makes for a pretty long, I'd imagine. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it's just for me. Some people still, st- there's plenty of people that shoot two stage triggers still, and, okay. and do plenty fine um, at competition. But they've they've got themselves disciplined enough to where they can always, right off the bat, as soon as they're back on the trigger, they get through that first stage, and they're just resting on the second stage, waiting to pull the trigger. Okay, right. right. Whereas my brain doesn't work fast enough to do that. <laughs> I just go, ooh, target, yank, right? Gotcha. <laughs> Whereas with a single stage. I can kind of do that and get away with it, right? Because I'm I'm not I mean, cause as soon as I touch the trigger, it's going off. Bam, essentially. Yeah. yeah. What uh, what are you using, Nick? Uh, mostly I use single stages as well. Okay. Yeah. And he's yeah. slow too. Do you? Okay. Got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there you have it. If you use a single stage, uh, yeah. no, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, do you feel? How do you feel about like? 
in terms of uh, is the trigger the most important part that you're quote spending money on if you're looking for a gun like and you and you want to be pouring your money into a gun that's got one attribute that's really amazing are you going for the trigger are you going for I know we had a, a podcast a while back with Ian where we talked all about barrels like are you going for something with that super nice barrel um, like beautiful buttery Tika esque action what uh, what do you feel is most important is it that trigger. It's definitely very important. But it d- does depend on if you're, are you buying a stock rifle or are you doing like what we did for this, where we did that, uh, um, the budget long range build or the budget custom. Yeah. We got to kind of pick and choose. Yeah. That was, so that does make a difference a little bit because if you have, let's say a medium quality action, medium quality barrel, medium quality stock, medium quality trigger, the best you're going to get is a medium quality rifle. So, um, yeah, I guess it just depends a little bit on what you're trying to do as well. Uh, for instance, um, this stock being as flexible as it is, I probably wouldn't um, put a lot of uh, eggs in the hole, <laughs> hole shooting it offhand. Or actually, I'd probably want to shoot that gun offhand more or feel more comfortable shooting it offhand than I would really loading into a bipod because I know how much that stock's going to flex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, whereas if you have a more rigid stock or something like that. So I guess it just depends quite a bit as far as that goes. So that, that's that's actually a good point to bring up, right? So if you plan on sticking with a 100% factory rifle, you want to get a stock that's rigid. You know, So make that part of your mm-hmm. um, determining factor on what rifle you buy. Um, because I can tell you, a flexible stock will drive you crazy when you're in the learning phase because you'll you'll get um you'll get uh vertical dispersion downrange from depend on how much pressure you're putting on the bipod or not putting on the bipod um it really can wreak havoc on a gun mm-hmm. right. um, and then you're wondering what well, did i miss because of me or did i miss because right. of, you know, yeah that's yep. that's the worst exactly so i mean i honestly until you get into s- some of the um factory guns that are in chassis or that just come with a quasi custom stock maybe it's a one of the bell and carlson stocks those you know probably the most affordable precision stock um i think remington has some 700s that come with a bell and carlson that you know are still not absurdly expensive you know once you over get over a certain price point just finding a stock that's under a thousand bucks sometimes is is difficult Mm -hmm. so um but yeah, no, there there are some factory rifles in the market that come with very rigid, um, you know, fiberglass stocks, or um, I guess there's some of the laminate stocks are actually pretty good too, as long oh, as yeah. they're properly oh, floated. Sure. And yeah, I mean, my first prison rifle was a Savage twelve. What are they? Twelve varmint. I forget the letters before the twelve, but <laughs> so a hunting rifle. <laughs> but it had a Scott. Yeah, it was just a hunting rifle. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it had like a laminate stock then. Yeah, nice. Yep. Like a and wood, that, like a wood laminate. Like yeah, kind of like that cool gray laminate look. Or no, it was um, it was br- like a brown. Oh, okay. laminate stock. Yeah. Yep. Um, it was on a lot of Savage rifles back then. I don't I know if they still what, use it at I think all. I know what you're talking about. And and that's an easy thing to replace on a lot of rifles. So if you yeah. consider like oh, one of my first, what I call a precision rifle, was a uh, Remington 700 SPS Tactical. Um, so it was, a, it was an 18 or 20 inch 308. Anyways, um, it had a Hogue overmolded stock. I think probably one of the more flexible stocks on the market. And it drove me absolutely banana sandwich, you know, trying yeah. to get that thing to shoot right or at least shoot consistently because depending on how much I loaded the bipod, uh, if I was shooting off of a bag where that bag was located on the fore end, there's a lot of things that just went wrong and you never got that level of consistency where you could go out shooting, um, you know, lay down some groups and use that data as training fuel. You know, mm-hmm. you, you want to be able to, when you're starting off, you want to have consistency so that as you, when you go out and do your training sessions, when you're, when you're learning how to shoot, you can actually use what happens down range as, okay, well, I need to change that. And if you're not able to get consistency out of the rifle, then you're just not, you're going to have crap data is really what it comes down to. Well, that's like a tricky thing to diagnose too, because it's not like, it's not like it's loose or right. you know you can't be like well do i need to tighten this it's just like kind of the way it's the way it is jim like an aspen yes uh, and that right. that actually that fix uh was me ripping off that stock 
putting a three hundred and fifty dollar Bell and Carlson stock on there, betting it, and that thing was an absolute hammer after that. But nice. that was all it took. That's pretty cr- yeah. Huh. Well, and you probably didn't even need to bet it because the Bell and Carlson's have the aluminum V block. Yeah, right. You yep. just did it as overkill. Yep. type thing. Pretty so. much. Nick had had it at that point. Yeah, I was just ready to. Honestly, I was at the point where I didn't have enough knowledge at the time too. But I, you know, I had a, a low enough budget where it was like, okay, well, either I throw the rifle in the garbage and get a new one, or I try a different stock and see what happens. And, and mm-hmm. the different stock did it. But yeah, I definitely went overboard with. I didn't have to bet it because of the aluminum V block, but uh, I did anyways. And it did you check out great. a lot of things where you're like, oh, I need to check. Like, I think something's going on here, and you checked a lot of things, and then you kind of finally got to that point. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did what a lot of people thought, too, is, uh, God, there's got to be something wrong with the scope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. Um, there is, like you said, the stock is pretty easy to change out on on uh, factory guns, really any kind of gun. It's, it's pretty doable, generally speaking. Um, you can change out other stuff, too. I'd say from there it gets progressively a little bit more and more difficult. Like we were talking about that trigger earlier. You can change out triggers Mm -hmm. um maybe go and get a factory rifle that's not as expensive swap in a different trigger perhaps um then of course i guess if we're sticking with the whole budget thing because now we're talking about precision and we're talking about budget you do end up in a funny situation maybe you can spread out your cost over time but i have a factory rifle that i bought that was very cheap that now has a lot of money's worth of of upgrades to it and i still get frustrated with it all the time right and now it's, you know, I've put, and, and mine is that, that Ruger American in a Magpul chassis with a suppressor on it, with a Cerakote job on it, with a Scott Park special trigger job that I still don't know what he did on it, and uh, some other stuff like that, you know, and a nicer optic. And I'm still thinking to myself, after well over a grand, probably even close to two, uh, with everything on it, uh, I'm like, yeah, I like this one better, you know, the, I, the custom I, one that we did. <laughs> I also feel like that was a lot of steps and time and process in what you're describing there, Jim. And gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong. That sounds a lot like an RPR. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, like a Ruger Precision. Right? Yeah. What are those going for? Twelve. Something like that. Twelve hundred. Yeah, they'll seem sweet. like pretty good option for kind of like what we're to, not to like name drop stuff, but for. Kind of oh, what yeah. we're talking about. Oh, a lot absolutely. of manufacturers have their equivalent now too. Yeah, yeah. DK yeah. has one. Savage has one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much everybody. Lot. Everybody, yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, that is something that you could uh, that you could do. You know, um, what was I thinking about with these with these more budget oriented rifles? Like he got, um, like the ones we talked about in, in our our other podcast. We had, you know, the we had Savage has one, Mossberg has some. I mean, everybody likewise also has a, a pretty affordable rifle that Hawa, Tika, I mean, there's yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. Most uh major rifle manufacturers right now have a more competition type setup, you know, with a right. chassis or something like that 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 kind of checks most of the boxes yeah. really well. And most of them even have one similar to like the Ruger American here that has like a plastic stock on it and it's even a little bit less expensive. Um, and I guess the thing the thing that I have to wonder about is when you look at these, you know, we're talking about, well, it's, it's definitely good to have a more rigid stock. It's good to have a better trigger. It, it wouldn't hurt to have a better barrel, in, you know, in certain cases. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I mean, like, I know I've, I've done it. Lots of other people around here have done it. Like you can get them to shoot well. Oh yeah. So if somebody is just in that camp where they're like, look guys, that's super cool. And all I love to upgrade my stock. I love to do all this and everything. But like literally my budget is, I don't know, you know, 400 bucks for the gun and I can, I can slap a scope on it to the best of my abilities. But like, how can I make that? work right is it just that i have to be like way more conscious about consistency of how i'm doing everything than i would with something else that's more forgiving or a big thing to keep in mind is what is your level of precision that you want to achieve too okay you know if um you know, I think most guys getting into long range shooting, they start off at that, you know, mythical 1,000 yards. If I hit that 1,000 yard target, I'm, I succeeded, you know, and yeah. immediately after you want to go further. But, um, right. But is that a, a man sized target, a exactly. silhouette, yeah. or, or do you want to put, you know, 10 rounds in an X ring, which is five inches? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. That's um, a, that's a huge thing, you know. So considering what is your, what is, what is your level of quality or level of precision that you want to achieve? Um, 
yeah, if I want to hit that silhouette target out at Coon Rock at, you know, a uh, thousand yards, um, definitely do it with that hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but if I want to drop a five inch group out there, I'm probably going to need to, you know, upgrade some stuff. Sure. And for, I mean, like if you're, if you're kicking this around and, and you've heard people talk about shooting really tiny groups, you know, versus shooting, Oh, a man sized target at a thousand yards. I mean, the fact of the matter is shooting a big 18 inch piece of steel at a thousand yards is still super fun. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you <laughs> it's know, fun. it's like hearing the steel report back and you know, you shoot the gun and you see it impact and then you're like, did I hit it? Did I hit it? Did I hit it? Ting. <laughs> I, like that's super awesome. So, I mean, you can still have a ton of fun. And to your point, you got to just know what your level of fun is. I think, I think everybody has their own personality styles and you have to realize whether or not you're the person who, as soon as you hear that ting and you hit that target, you're like, well, how can I make it better? Right. Then you're probably maybe going to want to save up or something and, and go in for something that would be a bit more consistent or a bit more accurate or something like that. Because you're inevitably going to end up wanting, okay, hit the seal target, the big one. Now I hit the small one. Now I want to shoot a group. Now I want to shoot out further. Right. Uh, right. But you know, some people are just kind of like, nah, I just, I just want to be able yeah. to shoot a thousand yards. That'd yeah. And, and let's be clear. Like we're talking like an 18 inch target, a thousand dollars is an easy chip shot. We're talking about on day with like barely any wind. Um, you know, cause, right. eight, cause 18 inches at a thousand can be a very difficult shot on yeah. mm-hmm. very many days for the oh, best yeah. shooters, oh, at I least for a first round them. hit. You know? I've missed plenty of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, or, if, yeah. Or if you have, um, a range like ours where the wind literally is swirling nonstop and it's very hard to call. It, it does it some weird things out there. Well, okay. I'm going to take this all the way back into hunting, but Jim and I were uh, chasing coyotes out there earlier this year. And in my, like we had the wind, there's barely any wind, but it was definitely like in our favor. And that dog was probably 250 yards away and it must've swirled in that bowl. And he got out of there. Like yeah. it was like, it was really, it was interesting. I still haven't figured out how he got our wind, but he definitely the, did. The problem is out there at that range now, like you said, we're totally off topic. We were down <laughs> near the thousand that's, yard target. That's obviously, what I'm here Obviously, for. we were the only ones shooting. We were down there. We were in a bowl, as you mentioned, where the trees kind of come in and make like a weird, like, uh, signs the movie alien shape. And then uh, that's one of three bowls between the firing line and the thousand yard target right. that all have different winds going on. So, yeah. Yeah. I've literally watched the trees. At the thousand yard berm or the ten fifty, do this. Just circles. <laughs> when I'm spotting for people. A out vortex, there. if you will. It sounds like yes. you're describing a vortex. Yes. <laughs> and then somebody says, What's the wind doing? How should I hold? And then you you're just like, say bah, bah. Oh, it's, it's it's great when I have guys out there because they get impatient, you know, and they're like, What's the wind, Scott? A second later. Scott, can I get a wind call? I'm like Chill out. Do you, <laughs> you want to do this? Yeah. <laughs> I am yeah. trying. I will turn. Well, not this gun around. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I am just a machine. I will turn, I will turn the around. spotting <laughs> scope around. Uh, uh, um, okay. So get back on topic. Yeah. Yes, we can do that. And not to take over this, but I, want, I have a question for you, Jimmy. Please. So um, five minutes ago or so, you mentioned that you spent all this money on this Ruger American mm-hmm. that you have. Yes. Which I still and, love in a weird way. Don't get me wrong. Sure, and then and then you built this semi-budget custom gun, and you like it better. Yes. Wh- why do you think you like it better? Um, I think for a number of reasons. Uh, I I do I do feel like you when say I say that muzzle break, I'll come across the table. It's not the muzzle break, <laughs> yeah, Scott. Thank correct. You. I, it's not. Trust me. Um, <laughs> the the ringing in my ears is brought to you by that muzzle break. But um, I feel like if it if I were to rewind back when it was six years now or something when I first got that Ruger, I wouldn't have wanted something like this. I would have, I, and I actually did. I loved the Ruger. It's like all I wanted. It was it was cool. It worked, and uh, I used it long enough that I figured out what I wanted, and that was basically a rifle with a really smooth action that fed the rounds every time, uh, and yeah. What, and just like was a bit more consistent um and so i don't know i mean like this it's just it's like upgrading from your high school car to like your first adult car i don't know you're like oh my gosh the radio works you know or you're like <laughs> or like 
wow, I don't have to jumpstart it every morning. There's just like different things that you kind of sure. got used to before that weren't that nice to deal with, but you figured it out. And now you're like, oh, wow, it's like a whole new world. I don't have to deal with these weird annoyances. So I'm going to guess, um, you might have to think about this, I don't know. But along with all those little things you just mentioned, right, like the action being smooth, feeding rounds every time, um, that a, a big portion of why you like shooting this gun has to do with how much heavier it is. That, yeah, that very well could because be. Because a heavier gun, and this is the reason I'm getting into this, I want to talk about um, gun weight a little bit, right? Um, because a, gun, a heavier gun is just easier to shoot, right? It's, it, it's easier to manage the recoil. Yeah. Um, Generally, uh, the like the recoil is less. Um, it's more stable. Just mm-hmm. seem you know everything because just got because of gravity. Right? It just sit it's it's easier just, to practice your fundamentals too. Exactly. When you when you go to run the bolt, you don't twist the rifle a bunch it, just exactly. by unlocking it. It just right. the rifle just kind of stays there while you unlock yep. it and run the bolt. Yeah. So I imagine calling your shot is a lot yeah. easier. Oh yeah, yeah. Recoil management. Yeah. Absolutely. Your your position behind the rifle. I would I would argue matters less. I mean, if you take a lightweight rifle and you get out of your position a little bit, uh, then that gun recoils. It's going to move differently than the shot before. Or if you have a super heavy rifle, that recoil impulse um, isn't going to shift your point of aim dramatically from shot to shot, and, you're, and so you're not going to have a, a change in your position as often through a string of fire. Yeah. So, so having that heavier rifle just gives you that extra level of consistency. Yeah, and so so the reason I bring that up is I, I really think that needs to be um, kept in mind when you're when you're buying this new rifle, right? Because I think, at least for me, um, when I was first getting into it, really the only references back then were like snipers and whatnot. They were the ones who did long range shooting, right? Yeah. Um, and at least from, just from watching TV and whatnot, right? <laughs> Discovery <laughs> Channel. Um, so I thought that, you know, I needed to be concerned about weight, you know, that, you know, a lighter rifle is going to be easier to carry. Well, as it turns out, precision shooting, you're not carrying the rifle a whole lot, right? Mm-hmm. From stage to stage or from what, you know, you're just not carrying it a whole lot. Um, so if you can, you know, find a factory gun that has um, a relatively heavy barrel, if you can, mm-hmm. um, and just, God, if I would look for something that's at least twelve or thirteen pounds minimum. You get you get below that, and then then your fundamentals become way more critical. Okay. Now here's the thing: I'm not saying don't train on fundamentals. You you definitely need to get those down because they'll it'll bite you in the butt if you don't right. sooner or later. Um, but yeah, minimum twelve, thirteen pounds. Um, you know, total ideal like easy to shoot rifle with scope and everything on it. I think 16 pounds, mm-hmm. um, 16 to 20 anyways. Yeah. Cartridge dependent, obviously. Yeah. Obviously it's going to depend on recoil, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're shooting a 338 Lapua, then I'd recommend like, but a like 20 a six, to 25 five, pounds. Right. <laughs> you know, but like a, a six, five Creedmoor, um, very manageable. Uh, but you, you know, at 16 pounds, the six, five Creedmoor, you can definitely identify, things that you're doing within your process. So if you take a shot and miss, there's, there's not such a, a, a violent reaction after you pull the trigger that you can't look back at, okay, what did I do? Did I break that shot wrong? You know. Yeah. So being able to go back and reanalyze your shots is a lot easier on something that's not pushing you around a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, after four Vortex Extremes with that Ruger American, I, I do know that every time I shot the rifle, it was like, Gun moved a lot, usually twisted in my hand, like mm-hmm. tried seeing my impact, couldn't get back on the target in time. Then you try to run the bolt and unlocking the bolt, twist the rifle over so you're fighting with it to get back on the bipod at the right angle. You run that and then it's like, where'd the target go? And, right. I mean, there's just a lot that happens after you pull the trigger. Yeah. In your opinion, like, okay, you got one of these lighter weight rifles here. Um, more of like actually kind of like a more sporting rifle. They're definitely capable of of, mm-hmm. of good accuracy. They both shoot good. Um, yep. If you had something like this and learn to shoot it really well, will that make you like a great shooter when you transition to definitely like? Definitely gonna help. It, that'll help. Or it's definitely gonna help. Yeah. It won't be like um, like you're having to like relearn like a different style of shooting or different. No, I, I think it's. Uh, 
I guess you could equate it to, you know, Major League Baseball where they, they put a weight on the bat when they're in the batter circle and okay. take the weight off. Right. It makes the bat feel lighter, you know, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't see any – there's definitely no downside to it. Mm-hmm. It's well, going to make shooting easier. If you, if you learn fundamentals on a lightweight gun, mm-hmm. like, it's going to be a walk in the park on a heavier gun. Right. Yeah. One of the best training rifles I can think of was actually probably like a, a 308 AR just because <laughs> it's probably the heart uh, <laughs> 308 is going to push you around a little bit more. I mean, it, it definitely not a super high recoiling gun, but then also with the AR platform, your technique has to be so much better to achieve the precision that you want out of it. So if you can get your process and your fundamentals down so that you're shooting extremely well with that platform, then awesome. You mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of people that use 308s as their training guns, even if it's a bolt action for that reason, the extra recoil, um, uh, so that, you know, your fundamentals have to be just a little bit better using it. And it yeah. also trains you on recoil mitigation. To be clear, I'm not aware of any precision 300, 308 gas guns that I would call budget. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. None that's, of those are budget. That's the truth, right there for sure. <laughs> well, what uh, there, I know a certain 300 WSM that we would let go for a very cheap <laughs> price. <laughs> Come on, Jim. That's a five MOA gun. <laughs> <laughs> is it a gas gun? <laughs> it is. You know what? Actually, at this point, we I wouldn't even care if Scott pulled it all apart. Yeah, we can give it to we you. We should Scott. have you take a look at this thing. Fix it. I have a. I actually have, and I don't believe they ever came out with them, but I actually have a 300 Remington short action Ultra Mag hmm. from DPMS. Really? My yeah, goodness. they advertised them for a year or two, but I don't think they ever got the magazines figured out or something. It just wasn't feeding the way they wanted. So I don't think you they you somehow ended up with one. Yeah. It's amazing what happens when you work in the industry for a while. You right. just know people. It happens. I'm that sure you me. you all know exactly what I'm talking about. Thanks, that Shelly. is <laughs> I get Nah, it. no idea. <laughs> this involved baseball bats and kneecaps. <laughs> uh, but um, yes, how about uh, have we exhausted the rifles a little bit here? Do we talk about ammo a bit? We can talk about rifles forever, but I feel like we want to talk about the whole package here. I got. Right. I do have a question. All right. Or I have I mean, something to add to it tell as you, well. So. Tell you a question. All I'm, right. I'm going to tell you a question. Uh, like so, all the all three examples that we have here have a magazine, right? Yes. But like with this Tika or the Ruger, can you like will this Tika Meg? Can you get like a twelve round Tika Meg? You can get extensions for them, I think. Okay. I didn't know, like, depending on the application, right? Like, for hunting, this is everything you need, Maybe right? not Perfect. this specific one, but I know that there are some aftermarket extensions for some Tika mags. But for that stock? This one in particular, I don't know, though. Okay. Now, there are companies that make aftermarket bottom metals to where you can use, right. like, a- Accuracy International Okay. Mags. Gotcha. Yeah. So, that'd be, like, you could, down the road, modify this and... Right. Okay. Yeah. Just be uh, mindful of that. Because right. that's how I ended up with a Ruger American that I have to, to right. top finger, load. finger load. No, it doesn't even top load. <laughs> you literally have to yourself use your finger to push the, the round in the chamber every single time. But that's because it came with a five-round mag that worked perfectly fine in the mag pull chassis that I got for it. And I thought, hey, I'll stick a 10-rounder in there for the Vortex Extreme and not even bring my five-rounder because I think it'll work. It wasn't like a, it was a different brand of magazine. It was a the different whole brand thing. of magazine. I'm not the whole convinced thing was that you bar. couldn't. And uh, you're not convinced I couldn't... I'm not convinced you couldn't find like a higher capacity meg that would actually feed the rounds. Oh, I agree with you. I thought you were about to say I couldn't make the one that I had work because I tried. No, <laughs> it was didn't. hard to watch. Anyway, just be mindful of that. Magazines can be, uh, can be odd. A lot of people just think that they're just like automatic. Hey, if I have magazines, any magazine, just stick it in, it works. It's They're pretty complex. Yeah, magazines one, are probably the most most underestimated oh, yeah. um, piece of equipment. You make, guys found that out on the uh, pod venture where we were talking about, you know, how everybody's kind of got that one magazine that's their go-to for that rifle because they know it works every time. Yeah, no, it's because absolutely. they cleaned a the stage once with that magazine. <laughs> 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 they have the same pair of underwear on also. Oh, yeah. 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 Confidence well, hey, is important. You know what? Sometimes that works. <laughs> on that on that note, though, we were you know we we're talking about consistency, and, and that was one of the things that when we did that rifle, and then we had Isaiah build that other one, Marks, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, that was one of the things. Like, so he actually kind of changed my my outlook on when somebody's getting into precision shooting, 
you know, I, I kind of like, yeah, get what you can afford and go out and shoot it. And that's fine. You know, anything that gets somebody into the game is a good thing. But to his point was, if anything, that new shooter needs the highest quality piece of equipment possible so that they can become better. It, it's a lot longer learning curve for somebody that, you know, if you have a gun that, you know, shoots very inconsistently depending on the position you're in or whatever, um, if the rifle itself is inconsistent, you as a new shooter are going to have a much more difficult time learning. And you might just get pissed off and stop. Yeah, and then you just won't the same my game and then be done with it. Right. So that was something that he definitely really changed my outlook on what a new shooter should get. Now, with that being said, not everybody's got an infinite budget. So you have to yeah. get something that you can physically afford, but definitely don't cheap out on something if you think that you might get into the game. Yeah. yeah the, the good thing is, is that there are multiple affordable rifles mm -hmm. these days that absolutely shoot fantastic. Yes. You know, I mean... I don't know how many RPRs we bought in the original, like the original year the RPRs came out. I know I'd gotten one, Travis Brand got, I mean, probably six or seven guys. Yeah. yeah. And out of out of all those rifles, I think mine was the worst shooting one, and it shot like half inch. Right. Yeah. And like Travis had multiple groups that were literally in this, like just looked like the bullet diameter out of his. So crazy. And, you know. And and the same thing out of the Ruger Americans. Well, because yeah, I mean those it's, are Ruger it's Americans. A, it's the and same chassis. barrel, basically, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Tikas are the same, you know, essentially the same way. Um, the 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 good thing about Tikas is, is you get a good trigger right out of right mm -hmm. out of the box, and the action, and, mm -hmm. the, and the action's phenomenal. Um, you know, and you got any of a good platform for. Uh, Later on, if you want to do a you know a prefit custom barrel, yep, you know because yeah. Proof has prefits, uh, Proof Research. Is there anybody else doing prefits for Tikas besides Proof? I don't know. That is true though. Like, if I bought, yeah, because well, well, I did. I got a Ruger American. I've, everybody knows about it. We talk about it all the time. But I tried upgrading it. In hindsight, I should have just left the Ruger the way it was, pretty much, and just bought a different gun that was like a Tika or something a little bit nicer. Uh, when I when I felt as though it was my time to upgrade, right? Sure. That's what I feel like I should have done. If I would have bought a Tika to begin with, let's say, that's one that you can shoot as is, and it makes sense to then go and play around with it and upgrade stuff later on. Like yeah. I just feel like it's a better platform for yeah. future upgrades than one of, and we pick on the Ruger American here a lot, but it, it, but it's similar competitors as well. Like you buy one of those and you try to upgrade it later on, you're like, hey, maybe you should have just bought a different gun. Yes. You're kind of a natural tinker too, so that's like your personality. You're like, oh, let's futz with this thing, and it's kind right. of like a low consequence, you know, project in a way because yeah. you're yeah. not like. Tikas really are, to me are a little bit like the AR or like the Jeep of of bolt guns. Mm -hmm. Like they just yeah. have. There's a lot of mods you can do for them. They're kind of the new 700. They're like yeah, that's a good like point. this decade. Well, I mean, shoot, Remington yeah. 700. Right. Yeah. You know, for years Remington 700 was really the only action out there that that people were making custom parts for, and I think that stemmed from just the military contracts that well, were out all you know pretty much for decades. Makes All sense. of the sniper rifles were Remington actions. So yeah. and they, you know, as they progress through the years, they wanted detachable mags, Pictini rails, different stocks. You know, I mean, Marine Corps went through what, seven iterations of different seven hundreds. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, I think you know we talk always you know, when we're talking about scope cycle. Like, well, what are you going to use it for? You know, and I think we've been talking about a lot of the stuff in the context of like competition, competition shooting or precision rifle shooting, but like this Tika out of the box, lots of amazingly positive attributes. I mean, I've had some Brownings that have very, you know, in my opinion, very similar features. Some things I like maybe better. Some things I don't as much. But you know, if you're looking at like hunting, right? Just hunting, Scott. And, you know, you want to shoot long range, you want to get, you know, your ballistic data and practice at some of these extended ranges, but maybe your practical hunting distances, just in general by situations that you're likely to encounter are, you know, uh, not giant shot strings, maybe 600 yards and then maybe 700 yards, something like that. Like you're kind of done. Like, or you could be if you wanted yeah, to. You could sure. definitely get a different stock for it that maybe mm -hmm. is a little bit more geared towards, you know, long-range precision. Um, that's not going to add a ton of weight. There's some great stocks out there. Um, there's just a lot of rifle here that you're getting yeah, yeah. for for your dollar. And like Jim said, it it makes sense to make some of those upgrades if you want. Right. Yeah, yeah there's not a lot you'd have to, like... A chassis. Yeah, right? 
that's it. You know, I, I put some different stock on there, something that doesn't have any flex in the floor. And even this, honestly, is a pretty good stock for not flexing it's pretty much. Rigid, yeah. It's yeah. Pre- pretty rigid. Um, other than that, I mean, you really don't have a lot you have to do to that to make it a, a one hell of a rifle. I mean, at, at the price point, it already is a great gun. Yeah. And I'm not saying a guy, I'm sure people have killed, you know, deer, elk with this thing at a thousand yards. So I'm not trying to like put a limit, like, right, oh, you should right. only hunt at, you know, whatever. Do you, you know? And I mean, some guys can kill stuff with their bow at a hundred yards. I can't yet. Is Magpul yeah, making, yet. is Magpul making one of their stocks for Tika yet or not? I do not know. Cause I mean, that's obviously super affordable. Right. Option. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm yeah. not sure if they're doing it for Tika though. I don't know. I um, think KRG does. And yeah, well, KRG initially sure. was designed around right, right, TRGs. Yep. All right, we got to make sure we keep going on. Right, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about rifles, like rifles are fun to talk about. Make it a three-hour um, podcast. Let's talk. We're get, we got to get to. We got to get to. And I don't know if this makes sense, but you guys tell me. I I figure we could at least bring up like caliber cartridge selection, whether or not you're going to go with factory ammo or reload, um, and then and then obviously we got to talk about optics and rings slash mounts too, but. Um, what do you guys think about like, in terms of budget, somebody who's thinking like, I'm like, they're like, got a budget is really up there in my priority list. Does caliber cartridge selection come into play there? Are you mostly just, obviously you're not probably going to go out and, and in that case buy the, the 338 Lapua or the, right. or, you know, whatever else where you're paying over a buck a round or something. Right. I mean, you pay over a buck a round for everything these days, I swear. But, yeah. you know, you're not going to spend uh, money on a rifle and then you're going to have, it's really expensive to feed. But there's a lot of calibers, you know, cartridges and stuff like that that aren't that expensive to feed. They're all kind of generally about the same-ish. Um, what would some of those be and uh, which would you recommend in there? I would say... Six Creedmoor, six five Creedmoor, and three oh eight. Is the regular six Creedmoor pretty easy to to find? Not that expensive these days. Um, well, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by regular, right? So, to me, like if we're talking precision, we've got to have decent ammo, right? Oh, sorry. When I say regular, I just I was meaning not six point five, just like six straight up Creedmoor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From Hornady, anyways. I don't know who else is loading it yet, but. Is anybody else loading six cream more? Um, I think a couple of maybe well, boutique some, shops, yeah, but sure. you know, um, but for just for large kind of scale factory ammunition, yeah. Hornady would be the best. Yeah, yeah. but price yeah. wise, through Hornady, I mean, there's it's essentially same price for three hundred eight, six five, six. Yeah, they're all very okay. similar. Nice, right? Um, you know, years ago, the quick answer to what caliber would have been three hundred eight because there just wasn't. Yeah, there wasn't the availability of of six five Creedmoor six you know just ten years ago really mm-hmm. right. Whereas three hundred eight, you have a lot of benefits to three hundred eight right. There's plenty of surplus that you're never not going to be able to find. Well, except for right now, you're right? Not be able to yeah. find three hundred eight ammo. Uh, Maybe this could be an argument. You know, again, the time stamping. You know, when we're talking about this, but I was at the store the other day and fifty BMG was the. The only thing that they had on the shelf, and some, and and like some curiously, said, some twenty-two two fifty. There was that fun. is curious, and like I said before, I was seeing a lot of three hundred wind mag during uh, some of the ammo scare. Interesting. Yeah. Anyway. anyway, I I agree with Scott. I think six Creedmoor, six five Creedmoor, and three hundred eight are probably my three go tos. Um, if it's somebody who's just getting into it, I actually still think I recommend three hundred eight, and it's. It's more or less if somebody's going to be really serious about it and want to get good at the game, you know, at, at long range shooting. With 308, for one, uh, you have a little bit more recoil. So you teach yourself recoil and mitigation. A lot more. Yeah. Recoil. Um, I would say. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Yeah. It's gentle. Um, Scott, has a, Scott has what we call RS, recoil sensitivity. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wind Self deflection diagnosed. is much more with the 308. You know, so you're going to learn how to read the wind. You're going to learn how to compensate for it properly. Um, You know, elevation adjustment, I don't really care. It's very consistent. You can repeat it over and over. Wind is where you're going to do a lot of learning. So something that does not um, transition through the wind very well is is very advantageous to learning. Um, The other thing that I really like about it, well, besides the fact that every ammo manufacturer makes 308, um, if you get into reloading, there's a ton of different bullet options. There's a ton of different cases on the market. There's more reloading data for a 308 than probably anything else 
Um, and then on top of that, if you want to get into reloading, um, and you want to experiment and learn about that type of thing, the barrel life on a 308 is immense. Oh, sure. Oh, so yeah, good point. I was forget about barrel life. And yeah. it's a relatively forgiving cartridge, you know, so you're yeah. not going to spend a lot of time trying to find a, a good load to hand load, right? Okay. 223, 308, I think you'll both fall in that category. Relatively easy to load. Yep. Um, yeah. So. I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of when you hear somebody say, um, I guess for me, since I haven't been around a whole lot of six screen or I haven't really shot it, I should say that one's still kind of like n- n- newer or something to me. It's right. just like perceived as different, but it like is newer. Yeah. yeah so, newer. but when you hear a six screen more, which a lot of people shoot in competition now and, and it is becoming more well known and you hear six, five, especially, I mean, we have a lot of people who are passionately sort of like, Oh, the six, five is just like the coffee drinking hipster, like, Birkenstock wearing whatever cartridge, uh, and then you hear 308. Those are comfortable sandals, yeah, Jim. That's what I've heard. <laughs> um, you know, and then you hear 308. You're kind of like I roll. I, there's there's a lot of people who are always looking for like what the next big exciting cartridge right. is because you're like oh, I want to get in on something that like not everybody else has. Be different. Find something that has its own unique properties. But I think again, if we're talking about somebody probably in the more beginner stage, looking for something that's more budget oriented. That's also probably the person who doesn't always want like a bunch of hassle and pain in the butt. And, right. and whenever you go like weird and different, I know this because I'm actually known as Weird Gun Jimmy around the office. You always end up with a big pain in the butt. Meanwhile, everyone else with their, you know, latte drinking six five Creedmoors <laughs> and their grandpappy's three oh eights, they're just going to the range, grabbing their ammo, shooting. Everything shoots well, and they say, "Boy, great trip to the range. See you tomorrow." And then they leave, and you're left there like fuming over why this isn't working and that it, i mean it's there's nothing wrong with getting what is the popular thing yeah yeah nothing you, and, wrong with it. and you bring up a good point jen because there's there, we have a lot of different personalities in this game right um no so if <laughs> <laughs> false if uh you know if you're the type of person like um like jimmy or myself which are similar in this aspect i don't know how many other aspects but in this aspect we are. <laughs> <laughs> um we like shooting, but probably just as much we like tinkering with stuff. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. You know, new cartridges, new guns, new mounts, everything across the board. Right? If you're – well, let me get back to the other person. So then the, the other end of that spectrum is somebody who literally just loves shooting. They don't really want to know much about the system. They just want to know that it goes bang and that they're hitting the target, and they learn just enough to – to do well um and and quite honestly those type of people not always but a good majority of time end up being like some of the top shooters because they're just focused on shooting yeah that's Mm -hmm. all they do yeah they're not worried about the other stuff that 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 guys like you and i are worried about you know that want to because it's fun we want to play with but we, we spend less time shooting because we're tinkering with stuff right you know um you know jim c is a perfect example right like well he's very mechanically inclined but when he develops a load, he doesn't measure anything. He just he puts powder in a case and puts a bullet right. in and seats it to whatever he thinks it is. And if it shoots good, he goes with it, right? Right. Like, mm. I can't do that. <laughs> 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 I need to know exactly yeah. what the seating depth of that bullet is, ex- you know. Um, so if, yeah. if I guess my, my point is, um, you know, if you're just getting into this, you know, be honest with yourself. If you're a tinkerer, well, then buy a gun you can end up tinkering with, mm-hmm. right? If you if you really just want to shoot, buy the gun, and it might be a little bit more money, but go with the buy once, cry once theory. Mm-hmm. Buy a little bit more expensive gun that's got a rigid stock, a good trigger, that you can just go out and shoot and practice. Yep. You know? And a caliber that's easy to find and easy-ish exactly. to find. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. For sure. What about optics, Jim? I agree with you, optics. Oh, we do have to ask real quick, though. Reload or buy factory? In this, for for this person who's who's very budget oriented, obviously there's the there's the stars in your eyes about how wow I can reload for and and a lot of people have talked about this topic before, but like you know, per round once you have all the equipment and time and space and all that, you may be saving money with reloading. But I mean. 
Yeah, that Are that gap and that gap's dwindling. Right. With the with the price of components and powder, even before COVID, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. powders upwards of two hundred dollars for eight pounds. These, you know, well, obviously it's a lot more right now. Right now, right now it's crazy. <laughs> it's got, yeah. yeah, it did actually seem that way. You know, I mean, it wasn't eight years ago. You could go to a local shop and buy eight pounds for 110, 120 bucks. Wow. You know, you could buy a pound for fifteen dollars. Now a pound's like twenty five, thirty. Right. It's it's crazy. Um, yeah, it's, for me, I would say if the gun's shooting good with factory ammo, um, I would, and I can afford it. I I would just stick with factory ammo. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple six Creedmoors, and there's no reason for me to hand load those things. It, they shoot factory ammo so good that I can't top. I mean, you've seen those. Oh yeah. One. I mean, it's at the rampage, was it two years ago? That thing was just poking holes. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. It was factory. I mean, you just can't, you can't load any better than that. I mean, there's right. no point yeah. in wasting my time. I mean, unless you just, for some reason, just super love it. Right. You notice how I threw in for some reason. in there. <laughs> 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 there are people that love reloading. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm not one of them. I love load development. I hate it when I have to do 250 rounds for a match though. And that nah, just sucks. But I like learning and figuring out what's going to do best on my rifle and why. And I yeah. like that. I would say, I would agree with you if, especially if it's somebody looking at precision on a budget because they're new to it. Um, going out and buying a case of factory ammo, it's going to cost you money. Uh, everything does. But you're also going to get a lot of consistency. You don't have to worry about something that you screwed up. If you're if you're getting into reloading and learning how to shoot all at the same time, that's a lot, that's a lot of variables. Oof. Yeah. Um, so when you start you're, you're not going to be able to know the difference either. Like you're not you're not going to be much. able to perceive right. what yeah. you're getting from yeah. quote you know reloading. Yeah. That's so, looking at a math equation in high school that was like literally just letters right there's not even a number in there you're like it's all variables i can't solve it (laughs) doing everything uh from a data and methodical way you know but go buy your case of ammo get the rifle that you can afford go out lay down a group with you know from prone and then try it shooting off a bench or off a bag and then try it shooting off of some type of structure barricade a rock whatever and then use that as your baseline and then repractice that but if you have the the ammo is consistent the whole time, mm-hmm. you at least know that is one factor that's you can pull out of the equation for the most part. Right. Uh, you know the the way that factory ammo is made anymore. You go buy a Hornady match ammunition, that's really good ammunition. You know to Scott's point that the six Creedmoor and you took that was that the first time you had shot that ammo like a couple of days before to that think gun. So. Yeah. yeah, probably. And it just performed amazing. There was very little reason for. I mean, you had SDs that were like three feet per second or something stupid. It was it was ridiculous. And you know, gets out there, shoots it, zeroes it, has a great match. But you didn't have to spend hours at the loading bench to do that. You're able to take the rifle that shoots good, the ammo that shoots good, put them together, and go to work. So yeah, from especially if somebody's starting off, yeah, that's and time is money. Time is money. I mean, it mm-hmm. is. Whether it has a dollar sign on it or not, it just it has value. Yeah. Well, time um, is money, and then just like, I mean, you know, talking like it, just getting into it, like barriers to entry, like, my goodness, like, oh, if I thought I had to, like, get all the reloading equipment, and no way, man. That's so not lot. where I'm starting. And right. if you're shooting one of those cartridges we mentioned earlier, like a 6.5, I know especially just from experience, 6.5 or 308, I mean, you're going to be hard-pressed to not find a factory loading because there's so darn many that mm-hmm. doesn't shoot out of your gun. I mean, right. Or, yeah, so. Um, yeah, the big thing that. is just, you know, I don't think we've covered this yet, but if, if it's not apparent, you know, you want something that has a match bullet in it. Right. right? So, you yeah. know, they're yeah. made They're made to, well, they're made to be for precision, right? They're, um, the style of the bullet um, is literally just made for shooting at targets, right? Um, you, want to, you want to stay away from hunting bullets um, just because they're made to do something different, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, they, and they will... Um, just by the design factors will have tolerances that you don't want to see in precision ammo. Right. Um, yeah. Unless of course you're in the middle of a ma- ammo shortage and you have to go get some burger <laughs> hybrid hunters or something. Well, bur- burger hunting <laughs> That's a little bit different, different, though. different yeah. story. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're just, they're just, it's precision bullets they're right. just with a thinner jacket. Um, so that's, that's a different story. But yeah. when you get into like the, you know, the 
Hornady um, ELDX versus e- ELDM. Yeah, like the ELD versus the ELDX, or or ELD versus like GMX. Like you know, like GMX is made for a specific. Do they still make the GMX bullets? I just so I was just citing the old <laughs> three hundred short yesterday, Scott, with some one sixty five GMXs, okay. and I, thought I really so. like that bullet. Yeah, um, you know, but the way that bullet's designed, um, since we're on a podcast, we really can't show you but um i got some in my truck we got some cameras here <laughs> the uh the way the it's like an inner bond type bullet right so you got copper going all the way through the center um whereas with a match bullet you literally just have a copper jacket yeah mm-hmm. right um so the consistency is is more dependent um on the lead and the jacket thickness when yeah. you're making that right because if you think about it so like similar to uh a car tire that needs to be balanced, right? Well, think about it, you know, a bullet spinning at 250, 300,000 RPMs, right? So it really needs to be balanced. Otherwise, you're going to have some serious issues. Sure, okay, yeah. Right? Um, so when you introduce these things to help expansion um, mm-hmm. with hunting bullets, that's just another factor that can throw that bullet a little bit out of balance, mm-hmm. you know, from bullet to bullet. So that that's the reason why you want um, precision, you know, match ammo. Or, or match bullets, anyways. Got it. Uh, for for precision shooting. Yeah, that makes sense. Consistency cool. is key to precision. Yeah. Right on. All right, now, like you said, Mark, optics. <laughs> I'm waiting. All right. So so um, patiently too. <laughs> let's talk. Let's talk optics. This is something I think that we can speak to decently well, uh, hopefully. And um, all right, in today's day and age, it's becoming increasingly more and more possible for somebody to go out and purchase a budget-oriented long-range rifle and find an optic that's actually also budget-oriented. Um, that, that actually works. That actually works. Right, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and oftentimes works quite well. And so what, uh, you know, um, what should somebody be looking for in an optic? We actually have a new one here that we're going to uh, eventually end up talking about here, I'm sure, but... Um, what should somebody absolutely be looking for in an optic that they need for long range? Like, I'm sure there's features, there's stuff that they that they want to find in a long range optic, and uh, and how is it that they're actually finding it somehow in in for a decent price these days? Right. So, I would say, you know, for me when I first got into it, the one thing that I looked at in optics was, or what I thought I needed to look at was optical quality. Okay. Which as you get more into it, you learn that that's, that's part of it, but it's really, it's not definitely, it's not key to, to precision shooting. Yeah. Right. Which is a bit borderline blasphemous. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, obviously you want to be able to see your target you want, you want to be able to see your bullets hit berms. If you're, if you miss a target, that type of stuff. Right. So you can't have horrible optics, but they definitely don't need to be, um, you know, tier one, type optics to shoot precision yeah um they don't hurt they don't hurt yeah it's Optical nice to have great. it's certainly oh, nice yeah. to have but it's definitely not the priority when it comes to precision shooting um the, the priority is the uh, biggest thing is that the scope holds zero right mm-hmm. sure. um the uh another big factor would be that the scopes turrets track to what they say they do um, and that they have an adequate amount of and that, adjustment. And they have an adequate amount of adjustment to, you know, if you want to shoot out to 1,000, you need to make sure you have enough adjustment to get out of 1,000 for the cartridge you're shooting. And that's why you see things like 34-millimeter tubes and things like that. Yeah, 34-millimeter right. tube will get you a little more travel over a 30-millimeter tube. Um, that's the the sole purpose behind a 34-millimeter tube, really. Um, it, it, it does allow some, um, some more design tweaks optically. Um, but yeah, that, that's another show. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Um, and then um, I think something that really gets overlooked uh, that's important for for at least, um, uh, you know, dynamic shooting where you're shooting multiple targets across, you know, you might be starting at 100, going out to 1200 and some of them are 270 degrees. Some of them are, you know, 30 degree bearing um, type thing. Is field of view. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. You know the uh, the wider the field of view you have, the higher magnification you can run um, to to see the whole field. 
right. of targets, right? Um, so I, that's that's probably my number one overlooked uh, feature for me, anyway. Like in my opinion, I agree yeah. with that. Um, and you once once you really get into shooting multiple targets, trying to do as fast as you can, like you really start to appreciate field of view, right? Um, so yeah, now and then would come optics after those things. Yeah, let's bring out this one here. I think actually by the time this podcast has released, you might, uh, if you follow the Vortex Optics page on social media, the main one, you might have already seen this. This is the Venom 5 to 25 by 56, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, uh, I mean, this is this is pretty cool. Because I, I still remember not even that long ago, long-range scopes from Vortex. It was, it was basically, you were spending a thousand bucks. Yep. I mean, essentially, at least, and then you know that that was the PST six twenty four. It's right there at about a thousand bucks, and then you were moving up to like the razors, right? And so it, that was kind of it, and really, and that was the case. Even the PST at that point in time, you know, Scott, you remember this, Mark, you remember this. The PST we came out with that, and that was a thousand yard, uh, that thousand bucks, and everybody was flabbergasted, blown away. Right? They're like, wait, yeah. wait, 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 wait. We get tall turrets. And if I order MRAD, the turrets are MRAD and the reticles MRAD, and the first optics are plane. the optics are good enough. It's first focal plane. I can shoot long range with this thing, and it's a thousand bucks. I mean, everybody, nobody could believe it. It, it was it was literally an unfilled niche at the time. Yeah. Yes. And and now in our lineup, you see we have um, there's another one on the table here. There's a there's a Viper HSR which kind of snuck in there, and that's you know that's I think right around nine hundred bucks. But then we have the Strike Eagle. Uh, which is a five twenty five by fifty six as well, uh, and it uh, it goes for around seven hundred bucks. Then we've had the Diamondback Tactical First Focal Plane, which was a pretty sweet thirty millimeter tube uh, scope with first focal plane for about four hundred bucks. But now, this thing is like, we're I'm back to the point of being a little bit like, how because right. this is a five twenty five by fifty six with a thirty four millimeter tube, like we talked about before, with uh, exposed turrets, elevation, and windage with a zero stop in the elevation turret, which I'm sure we'll get into in a bit, parallax adjustment, first focal plane, uh, EBR-7C reticle, so it's got like the, I mean, if, you, if you're not familiar with that kind of stuff, it's it's like a, quote, Christmas tree reticle, or it's got this grid in the lower two quadrants. Um, it's got like everything that you could need, and the optics are pretty darn good for what it yeah. is. Oh, yeah. Um, when you think of like long-range scope and checking all the boxes that folks like and want to check it kind of checks all the boxes yep it does yeah and parallax goes down to 15 yards yeah that's huge another plus. especially for, uh, for like dry fire and yeah, practice dry fire and or rim 22 fire. rim fires mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. i mean i mean that's and that's i think the price point comes in low enough that oh, you yeah, could even bring... stick that on a um uh was it the base class on nrl 22 so i mean you get like all the oh. features that you want, but you're still at a price that you can mm-hmm. jump into base class with it. Because oh I think gosh. I think street yeah. price, we're thinking probably like what, it's right around five hundred, five hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. You, that's a good point that we I don't think we we brought up. That is another avenue if you want to get into precision shooting and you don't have and you don't really have the money for a a, a center fire center fire precision gun. You can do precision twenty two shooting uh, and, uh, and, learn, up, and learn so many fundamentals. Oh, How God, did it yeah. take us this long to bring that up? Actually, that's a know. super good point. <laughs> I can say like I, everything I, is less expensive. I mean, I don't do a ton of like you know, really. I need to speak of like PRS stuff yet, yeah, Jim. But uh, if I was going to pick one, not like oh, I'm going to do the twenty two stuff and then graduate to the center fire. No, actually, the twenty two stuff is probably what's more appealing to me out of all of it. Right. Well, you don't you don't need as big of a range. Right. Right. Yep. Ammo's way more affordable if you can find it. Um, hopefully, maybe by the time this airs, ammo will be somewhere. It just sounds um, yeah. it just sounds fun. But yeah, you can does. buy it in large quantities. You get to right. experience all the challenges that you, you would with exactly. A rifle That's what I was going to get. Like yes. wind, and optics are still important. Like everything's still important. They're and harder to trigger, shoot really good. Important. That's mm-hmm. a that's a big thing. It's like like shooting an AR versus a bolt gun. You have a longer lock time in an AR with a twenty two. You you see those issues with your fundamentals um, exacerbated a lot yeah. more with a twenty two. I've noticed that myself, and I like to actually switch back to a twenty two every once in a while to 
you know, because it really shows where your issues are. Yeah, oh, absolutely. When, yeah. The tw- when the 22 stuff first started, I remember thinking like, it's like Nerf shooting, right? Like, whatever. <laughs> but now it's, I mean, it's legit. It, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And I and I have I have a Ruger American 22 and an MDT chassis, hmm. and that freaking thing hammers. I will tell you, it it it's not much more. It's my Voodoo is not all that much better than how good right. that thing shoots. Jeez. It's unbelievable. And I, what was it? One hundred ninety nine dollars? Not even one hundred forty nine? Whatever right. it was. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, putting, a little more with the stock, but yeah, right, right, right. And putting something like this on top would just make sense. Oh yeah. I mean, it's just it's it's like um, and explain so explain why I mean Scott, you went into some of the features that you need in a long range rifle scope. I mean. You know, having, for example, exposed turrets and not low-capped turrets, for example, like you see in a lot of hunting rifles. I mean, the exposed turrets are so much easier to get to. Generally speaking, I feel like there's got to be something with just the more space you're given or something like that. You're going to get more travel. And they're usually just like, can they be made just more precise when they're exposed? I mean, this is the engineering stuff. No, I think what, what it allows is since we don't have to have a cap, we can have a larger diameter. Which makes the numbers easier to read, the hash marks easier to see, mm-hmm. um, the allows the click feel to be nicer, okay. more tactile. Uh, yeah, you know, because the smaller you get in diameter, the closer together those clicks are going to be. Right, yeah, everything right. is just yeah has to right. be more condensed. Um, so yeah, more I mean, travel per rotation. At least it's yep. I, I guess you're getting finer increments and still a fair amount of travel per rotation, right? So you're getting right. like point one mil increments here and ten mils per rotation, which Correct. is pretty nice. Right. Yep. Um. So you have that. You have your parallax adjustment. So, you know, having when you're shooting precision, when you're shooting long range, shooting even 22 stuff at fairly closer distances, uh, but but really precise, having an adjustable parallax to dial in the focus and dial out parallax error oh, yeah. uh, is pretty big. Getting something with a fixed parallax, you could. Yeah. Well, the other the other downside of fixed parallax scopes is there's there's not a whole lot out there more than like 10 or 12 power. Sure. Yeah. Right. Um and and I guess that's something we haven't touched on, but for precision, you know, I would recommend you want at least 20 power. Okay. Probably 25. Not that you're going to use it all the time, but it's nice to have when you need it. At the top end you're talking about, yeah, right? In, the, in power. a variable power, power scope. Yeah. yeah. What so, do you what would you say then like some scopes could be a uh could you know be like a six to twenty four? So you're getting up to twenty four, but your lowest is six. Whereas then some scopes might be like a, a three to eighteen. So you're getting mm-hmm. close to twenty, but you have three on the low end. Like, is it is it nice to have a certain power for the low end, or does that not really matter? You're not on that that much. It, I guess it depends. You know, so the the big thing for on a first focal plane scope going to a lower mag. The, really, the only use for it is the field of view. So for like observation, Just mm-hmm. because something. because the reticle is getting so small, if you're going down to to three power or two power, um, yeah. that it, you can still use it as an aiming point, but it's you're not going to be very precise with it because it's, right. it's just so small. That's a good point. Um, and depending on your target background, you may or may not be able to see the reticle at all. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, if you're, you know, if you're gonna dual use the scope and you're not like a law enforcement officer then you know they typically like having something on the lower end for field of view for observation Mm -hmm. right but if you're a law enforcement sniper you know using that field of view on the lower end for observation but when you're taking a shot if god forbid they have to take a shot um you know they're turning up the magnification to a more comfortable level um plus they need to do id that it makes sure they're seeing that person right Mm -hmm. now with um with precision shooting you may need that magnification to make sure what you're shooting at is actually a target. Okay. Right? Like, because, you know, certain matches or certain ranges might have targets along tree lines. And if you can't see good enough on those tree lines, um, you might not know what you're shooting at, right? In which case, you should never shoot at something if you don't know what you're shooting at, right? Good rule Um, of thumb. Good advice. (laughs) Jim always has, uh, at least at the other location, the Rampage, the last couple of years, he's had these little diamonds um, at, as like a troop line going out, but they're, they're on, a, uh, on a rack of different size diamonds, but you're always shooting the smallest one. And once that target gets hit like more than three times, oh, the paint's gone. Oh. It is the same color as the berm. So <laughs> if you're if you're looking at it on ten power, you have no idea that that's a target until you crank it up and you can actually okay, I can see that's actually a little bit more of a gray than the brown berm. So uh, yeah, a little the extra magnification I think is 
necessary to have. It, you won't always utilize it. You know, I usually hang out around 15 to 18 power um, for most shooting. And, and that's doesn't matter if it's a mile or if it's, you know, 250 yards. I'm, it's just keep it there. It's fine. Cool. Um, but if you have that higher magnification, the other thing it really helps you do is really refine your zero. If you have that sure. perfect zero at, a, you know, zero at 100 yards, you zoom in, get it perfect. Um, being able to have that factor locked down just helps everything else throughout the day. Yeah. And that also probably then plays in, in tandem with that parallax adjustment there too, because uh, if you're you know you're zooming into a target because you want to see it better, but then at varying distances you zoom in and then you can dial in the parallax to see it even more sharply, right? I mean, because it it has an effect on both focus and the weird thing that we call parallax error, right. um, which which you know having not great focus at a certain distance and having parallax error if your face is for whatever reason your eye is off center from the optical system is good things to have yep um then you know okay so tube diameter we kind of went into that larger tube diameter does equal generally speaking more travel i have yet to see i guess an occurrence where it doesn't equal more travel i mean maybe it would yeah it's we can go in the weeds if you want and eh, i don't bigger scope tube equals more travel which can be good the longer that you're shooting uh magnification now how about uh the reticle because we're talking about first focal plane stuff here. Now, a lot of the first focal plane scopes you've got out there nowadays, pretty much all of ours I can think of, unless I'm forgetting one, uh, they're going to have like this sort of uh, that Christmas tree, like I said earlier, or like this wind grid or whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of names out there for it. Uh, in the lower quadrant. So you've got basically your standard crosshairs with information on them, milling information on them, and then you've got this dot grid kind of that starts out narrow at the top near the crosshairs, uh, the center, and then it gets wider as you go down towards the bottom. Um, now, everybody that I know of who shoots long range wants one of those reticles, like the EBR-7C or something along those lines, the old EBR-2C prior to that. Um, but uh, why? Are you guys using those dots all the time? Is that something you're holding off of fairly frequently? Or are you using the dots for something other than shooting? Or is it just the first focal plane nature of it that you like? For Like, why? It's, explain. For me, typically the only time I'm using it is if I'm at a match and um, either they tell you you're not allowed to dial elevation or you only have a certain amount of time and you just don't have time to dial. Got it. So you need to hold all your holds on the reticle. Um, and if it's windy, it's nice having those wind dots um, to, yeah. So you're not just holding out in space. You actually have an aiming point. You have yeah. a reference point to at the bare minimum, be able to bracket, Correct. you know, so you have something out okay. there, not just holding out in space. Got it. Scott, you were a fan of. I think you were one of the only fans of the old EBR one C. Yeah, you? I was a I was a long holdout man. You did. You tried to <laughs> you tried to keep that thing around as long as possible. That was for those not familiar. That was a Razor Gen two days early on. The EBR one C was a first focal plane reticle that didn't have a, a grid. Correct. That was nice yeah. and clean. Yeah, and and I'll be honest with you, I don't. I, to this day, I can't say that that reticle ever hurt me. I mean, I shot many a stages where I had to just hold and shot very very well with it i mean for me in my head it wasn't it wasn't very hard to just draw two imaginary lines from the vertical stadia to the horizontal stadia to where i needed to hold yeah mm -hmm. you know um but i mean it was i wasn't a beginner shooter at that point either yeah, yeah. right right um, for a guy for a self-proclaimed kind of slow guy i mean that would be that's that's some work right there. To do all that in your head. <laughs> it's it really is, and it's just it's the way you had to do it for many years, so it yeah. just became second nature, yeah. right? Um, Back you, when you either had to figure it out. Or, what's that? <laughs> Back when everybody was running mill dot, you had to. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I finally gave in with the when we were working on the EBR seven. I was like, all right. Oh, it took you that long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the seven. I was finally like, all right. The feedback we're getting is we can let's do all these other features that we did on the EBR seven. And since we can do the tree, we'll just add the tree in there. You know, it's not, it's not hurting anything. Um, and it'll, and, and it's our most, you know, that style of reticle is by far our most popular. Yeah. Reticle, uh, yeah. Everybody wants style. It. Right. Right. Um, 
there were still a few holdouts that really wanted the EBR one, but it was few and far between. Like we were, we were definitely the minority. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so. But the first focal point nature of these radicals, I mean, basically the fact is, and and we haven't really explained it for anybody out there who isn't yet fully familiar with first focal plane and, and second focal plane, but essentially, as you change your magnification in a first focal plane, the reticle appears to be growing and shrinking. But that's because actually your image is also growing and shrinking as you're changing the magnification, and the reticle is just moving with it at the exact same rate. So for you guys, if you are holding off of your reticle, in order to make precise shots, um, you want to make sure that that reticle is at the proper scale to the image, so that actually everything that your reticle says it equates to, really, it does equate right. to. And so you can then, if you are hanging out at like 15 to 18 power and not like 25 or something, you can still use all those. Right. Yeah. Hash and that, and, and that's huge, right? Because like you were saying at the beginning of, or the beginning of uh, when we were talking about the optics is um, there's, you can... Not all that long ago, um, if you were looking to do something budget, you were pretty much relegated to a second focal plane scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it wasn't going to have matching reticle and turret, right? Um, and now for what you paid for something fairly nice back then, second focal plane, you can have today literally twice the magnification, matching reticle and turrets, first focal plane. Um, yeah. It's, you know... It's it's unbelievable that I mean it, come yeah, this far. I mean, it seems like even yeah, not that long. I mean, I guess yeah, a first focal plane scope generally comes with those other features. But yeah, you're looking a G like oh, first yeah. focal plane scope yeah. that's going to be a thousand dollars. Now you're looking at the new. I mean, this thing has a zero stop in it as well, in the elevation turret. So that way, as you're dialing a bunch on a certain stage or whatever, you want to go back to zero real fast. I mean, you just spin it back and it stops on yeah. zero. I mean, actually, it stops five clicks beyond zero just in case. But I mean, it stops in a consistent spot every single time right next to your zero. You know, it's funny to think about that there's probably shooters that are listening to us that having a non matching reticle and turret just doesn't even make any sense to them. Like, why would anybody ever do that? And it's like, <laughs> well, it was only 11 years ago. And that's how all scopes were, yeah. except right. for a select few European scopes. Mm -hmm. Mil, Mil reticle and OA turrets. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what a pain that would have had to have been. That's what my first one was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had a, a second focal plane, mill dot reticle, MOA turrets. And, my uh, gosh. I, my, my first MRAD scope I got because of an accident. I accidentally ordered the wrong one. So I just taught myself how to use it. <laughs> and it happened to be matching turrets, matching, uh, matching reticle. And God. I never, never look back. <laughs> Saw the light. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, in the end, though, I, I think what everybody needs to know listening to this is just that we, we've we seen rifles take such a big leap in terms of what you can get for reasonably affordable price of what they can be capable of. Ammunition, you know, you can get such great factory ammunition for not, like, I mean, a ton of money, depending on the cartridge that you're getting. And, I mean, optics now are right there. You can build out a full package. Like, there's... If you went up to a, a higher level optic, like, let's say you went up to the Strike Eagle from this Venom here, you're going to get a bit bigger field of view. You're going to yep. get a bit better optics, generally speaking. And illumination. Illumination, thank you. Um, locking turrets. Locking turrets. So, these are some feature things and, and you know, optical performance. Certainly might not be an unwelcomed upgrade for somebody i mean somebody right. might say those are the things that i want so i'm just going to pay right. for them yep you go up to the pst gen 2s you go up to the razor hd gen 2s and stuff like that i mean you're going to start getting things there are features and and certainly um better and better optics as you go up um but i guess the thing is is it's like again looking at just what you need to do the job this has everything right. there's absolutely there's nothing lacking here and it is important to point out, from an optical standpoint, that thing ain't a slouch either. I no. mean, that is, I was immediately extremely impressed with it. Yeah. I mean, I shot two Vortex Extremes with the Diamondback Tactical First Focal Plane, 4 to 16 power. Did better on those two extremes than I had done the previous two, uh, where I was running a Razor 5 to 20. And it's not because of the optics necessarily. I think I did get better myself, but the optics in the next two obviously didn't slow me down because I kept getting better. Right. right. Yep. And this, I mean, this is tons better than the Dimeback Tactical First Focal Plane, which I remember thinking at the time I was like, 
baffled. I couldn't believe that. I was like, oh my gosh, right. this, this has everything. And now I'm like, the everything just keeps getting, it's, <laughs> it's like going from, I don't even know. It's like going from the laser disc to DVD. It's, uh, I mean, it, optics and in, in the shooting world is a lot like computers, you know, and, sure. and that, you know, it, in a very short amount of time, technology grows leaps and bounds. Yeah. I mean, this is really fantastic, especially when you consider the price. Yeah. And in three years, it's probably going to be obsolete. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> back in the day, right. back in the day, even if you were like buku rich, you couldn't get a 60-inch TV. Right. And now you go on a Black Friday, and it's like 60-inch TV for 350 bucks. <laughs> it's like the same thing. I mean, in some ways, with uh, with I mean, a lot of things and optics are included, like you said, Nick. I mean, yeah, it's wild. I think the point is, Jim, it can be done. You can shoot long range. It can on a budget. It can Absolutely. be done. Don't let people like Scott come in. <laughs> and tell, no, I'm just kidding. Because Scott obviously sat here and told you a lot of things you can't do for a budget. But don't let don't let people come in and say, you know. Um, Oh, you're trying to get in the long range. Well, you better have deep pockets. You better yeah, have at right. least two grand to spend on the gun. Whatever. Um, you can do it. Yeah, look at my PRS gun. Jim's super modest. <laughs> <laughs> or you can be like Mark, <laughs> spend nine grand and have somebody else build it for you. And uh, yeah. There you go. There is always there is always, There's always the Gucci build. <laughs> but all right. Any other things from you guys before we leave? I mean, I think we covered, hopefully we covered um, what we needed to. Yeah, that's all I got. I think uh, <laughs> I think a good Scott note. Scott was buffering again. <laughs> if I could make one note on the topic as a whole, is that although higher quality, more expensive equipment often does have its advantages, there's nothing that's going to replace practice. Yep. So. Damn it. Getting out, shooting, repetition, learning and I harp the fundamentals and people all the time, you know, in training classes or whatever, somebody just asked me a question, what's the first thing I need to do long range shooting is learn the fundamentals and rehearse them. Even if it's your thousandth practice, walk through the fundamentals in your head when you're pulling the trigger and, and then go, you know, get, get to work after that. But, you know, time behind the gun is what's going to make you a better shooter. Yeah, and nothing feels better than becoming a better shooter with a budget set up and then dusting people with really expensive setups. <laughs> yep, <laughs> agreed. Um, so, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, there you have it, everybody. If you have any questions around this sort of thing that you want to ask uh, Nick or Scott, let us know in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Also, we did have a podcast, like I mentioned a couple times there at the beginning, uh, where we went in depth on a whole bunch of different budget rifles. Um, that's another one you should go check out. And um, I want to say that there was even another one that I couldn't think of right now, all of a sudden, as I got We've to We've done speaking. a handful of budget things, Jim. We have done We're a handful budget conscious. of budget things. That we are. Um, so anyways, also check out the Venom 5 to 25 by 56. Super awesome scope. Um, we appreciate everybody for tuning in though, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye everybody. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.